All right. It is episode number 693 of Let There Be Talk. Welcome aboard, my friends. It is, uh, what is the date? It's Monday, April 24th. Episode's a little late because I got the fucking roofers. They're fixing some kind of leak on the roof. And they've been here, I don't know, five days. And I should have recorded it last night why they weren't working, but I was, uh, you know, diving into this goddamn show on Netflix. I'm, I usually don't, you know, watch stuff unless people over and over say, you got to be watching this. And it's people I trust. So people have been saying that for um, a few weeks now on this show, Beef with the great Ali Wong. And next thing you know, I was hooked. It's like 10 episodes. They're like 35 minutes each. And it's super original and super dark. And if you have not seen it yet, tune in. It is, it is, uh, it is twisted. And I, I, I really enjoyed it. Weird as fuck. All Asian cast, which is cool to see. I'm not some woke fucking dude like finally but it is cool to see different people uh you know an entire show uh pretty much asian people other than um who's on that there's a, a couple other comedians on it oh yeah andrew santino's on it he's definitely not asian ginger but oh man, I can't recommend beef enough. I hit up Allie and said this show is fantastic and just give her all the Emmys now. She kills it. It's wild to see. Cause I don't think she's done a lot of acting um that I know of. But watching it, just slaying it, just slaying it. And uh another case of uh you never know. You give somebody a, a shot. And you get a superstar that you didn't uh, know was out there. It takes one person, or actually maybe three or four, to, um, you know, open the door and then your whole life could change. It's wild. Check it out. Beef. So anyway, that's why I didn't do the podcast last night because I, I had a, a spot to do. Uh, another spot on a Sunday. Sunday spot seemed to be happening now. It was uh, gone since COVID. Comedy store has been back open on Sundays. And uh, this one, I didn't do a comedy. Uh, I didn't do comedy store. I did um, some bar show. I don't usually do bar shows anymore. I remember early on, Ari Shapiro was like, hey, you want to do this? Is it a bar show? Yeah. No, no, I don't do bar shows. And I finally got it later on in life. I was like, oh, yeah, bar shows suck ass. But this is a good one. A bar show is only good if they have a separate room like this one's upstairs and it's an Irish bar, which number one, I can't stand Irish bars. Uh, you know, Guinness <laughs> Irish bars. Not for me back when I was drinking. And matter of fact, it's really weird to be 57 and go into a bar. I went in last night. And you you go into the bar and then you go upstairs to the uh, separate room. And uh, so I go into the bar and I just kind of looked around at the uh, bar scene. It was just so bizarre to look at different age groups in this neighborhood. It's in my neighborhood, uh, neighborhood bar. And just that whole lifestyle, I just haven't seen in so long. So when I go in, I was just kind of looking. You had kind of like a younger couple in the corner, maybe a first date kind of vibe. Then you got three or four of the the real deal bar flies over there. Just, uh, and they, they hate everybody. Yeah, fucking comedy night. Fuck you, you know? And then you've got just random people in a bar, maybe some tourists, maybe some first timers. Let's try the Irish bar. I bet it's fun. So it was weird to look around. Just people in there spending money and drinking instead of just being a real deal alcoholic and just picking up your booze at a liquor store and going home much cheaper. But it was, uh, it was wild. 
went upstairs, did a set, working on new material, some struggles here and there. It takes a long time for me to get these new jokes going because they're not just one-liners. They're chunks. And to do the chunk, you have to do the chunk, if that makes sense. To do the chunk, you have to do the chunk. <laughs> it sounds like a an 80s new wave song. You've got to do the chunk. But to, uh, for real though, to do the bit, you have to do the whole bit. So you just start it up like, okay, it works all the way up until this part. And I'm still trying to find some new parts. So you're going along and it's working and all of a sudden it just stops. And in between the chunks, you got to do old chunks. And you're more excited about the new chunks. It's just a fucking, it's just a demon. I can see why people quit. You know, if you don't have the full strength and drive, you're just like, man, I'm out of here. And it, uh, it, there's so many weird, weird uh, things to comedy. What are you doing, Gertie? Uh-oh, Gertie. Gertie looks like she's going to get sick. Oh, no. Gertie, come here. Come here, Gertie. Something's wrong with Gertie. She was eating grass yesterday. I knew it, Gertie. Uh-oh. Oh, Gertie just got sick live on the podcast. Not like real sick, but she got, she fucking went, wouldn't stop eating grass yesterday. Took her to the park. You know, just like, you know, and then you're watching Instagram. Somehow they fucking knew I was at a park and they're like, is your dog eating grass? Oh, he's got gut bomb. You need blah, blah, blah. Oh, Gertz. Nick Gert is just laying there like, yeah, deal, clean that up. Clean that up. <laughs> I'm fucking podcasting. I'm dodging the roofers. Gertie just throws up. Man, my fucking, my fucking podcast is insane. You guys are like, just bring back the rock stars, man. That's why we're here. We don't want to hear about your bullshit. Give us the rock stars. <laughs> Actually, a lot of people have been emailing saying they like the solo episode. So that's fucking kind of cool. Uh, last week, by the way, uh, Spotlights. Great, great band. And a lot of you guys really dug it. You emailed me and said, hey, that band is fantastic. And that's what it's about, man. Spreading the word. So anyway, I'm doing the bar show, working on the new chunks. And I'm in the middle of the set. Some fucking guy, I'm up on this makeshift stage they've made. Really, really weird setup. You're on the stage and the people are like 30 feet away. I'm like, what? Is it? This is just set up for failure, you know? So uh, I'm doing the set and some fucking buffoon comes walking in with a yellow sweat jacket on, real bright, looking like fucking Big Bird. And he comes walking towards the stage and he just stops. And I'm like, what, what are you doing, dude? And he's just looking at me and I could tell he's looking over my shoulder. He needs something behind me. I'm like, is this like a comedian that forgot his phone? I've seen that a million times. You do your set, you're recording your set with your phone, and then you, you leave it up there by accident. So I was thinking, well, maybe he was up earlier and left his phone here. So I turn around, I look, and then I said, well, what's going on? He goes, sorry, man, sorry. And he reaches behind me, starts grabbing a cable off the TV screen. I'm like, what the fuck is going on here? It's like mid-set. I, I, I took a shower. I got ready for a Sunday night. It's mid set. And this guy's just acting like I don't fucking matter at all. This is the fucking problem with people. He, he's like, I, I don't want to wait until he's done. And uh, I don't give a fuck. It's about me. I need that cable. So I go, just grab your fucking cable, dude. And so he grabs it. And I figure he's done. But no, he starts grabbing like, all kinds of cables. And I'm like, what the fuck are you doing, dude? Now the crowd's laughing because I'm just destroying this guy. And he just starts winding up cables like it's an end of a night gig. 
And I'm I'm destroying him to a, a point to where he finally fucking leaves. And I'm talking, this is a good three minutes. And he's ruined the flow of my 20 minute set. And I'm down there to work on new material. Once you fry someone and you're doing crowd work, it's really tough to go back to material, especially when you're working on new material, because it was so organic and the anger I was firing at him was just like, you idiot. And I find out later, he's just this fucking dick that uh, hosts the, uh, the karaoke on Saturday nights at the Irish bar. And he left his cables there because he probably thought he was going to score a little pussy or something. And I'll get the cables later. This girl's digging me. I don't know what the fuck. I'm just saying that because I know how fucking idiot dudes are. Like, oh, man, I'll get the cables later tomorrow night when there's a comedian on stage. I roasted at one point. I go, hey, dude, I fucking I've been on TV before. You dick. Get out of here. <laughs> oh, my God, man. A karaoke DJ ruining my that's why I don't like fucking doing comedy in non-traditional venues because when you're doing them in bars you got the people in there like yeah these fuckers are ruining my basketball viewing or or these guys are ruining the football night or whatever you've hijacked their local watering hole and they don't give a fuck about you and usually it's never crowded now look if it's packed then the people outweigh the bar flies and you win. But these shows are never packed. They're always like somebody wants to try to do a show. You know, it's probably where he gets drunk three nights a week. And he's like, you know what, Timmy, I could probably do a comedy show here. It'll be packed. Comedy's hot. It'll be jam packed, man. That's how comedy was in the eighties growing up in the Bay area. Once that uh, first wave of the huge comedy hits, it it was just everywhere. Cheese factories, lumber yards, uh, bars, coffee shop, everywhere. Just everywhere you went, laundry mats, everywhere had a co- uh, comedian. <clears throat> it was it was insane. Anyway, that was the Sunday night, and during the day was wild because uh, let me hit off my spin <clears throat> my sparkling. What is this shit I'm drinking? Spindrift. Mm. Mm. spin drip not fucking bad man one gram of sugar one i can do that it's one gram of sugar i go to the gym every fucking day i can have one gram of sugar in my drink it ain't bad though anyway yesterday sunday uh bill bird did a live podcast at the troubadour which is one of the greatest la venues of all time the great troubadour down on santa monica and uh started at noon live podcast at the troubadour and i i I hit up my buddy greg i said let's go down and uh themilis my buddy andrew themilis who produces the burr podcast said yeah get there around 11 which i felt was kind of early like why am i getting there right at 11 it doesn't start till noon but I did it anyway, and I parked out front, and and and, and I, I think about life all the time, how things happen. It's so bizarre how life works. A lot of people, you know, during that COVID were like, are you going to fucking move out of that shithole LA? It's like, no, no, I'm not. I like LA. Also, I don't have $100 million just to go move anywhere I want. And I'm still heavily in the comedy game. And meaning that you have to be where the comedy business is. If you want to take it serious, LA, New York, those are the heavy duty comedy machines. So I've always said that life works weird. And if you're doing, you know, entertainment, comedy or whatever, you got to be out in the fucking stream if you're panning for gold you can't pan for gold on a a dirty field (laughs) and that's just the truth it's the same with comedy you want to be around in the business the energy 
that anything could fucking happen. You could be in a restaurant, a guy can walk up and say, hey man, saw you last night at the comedy store. I think I got a role for you. Or, hey man, saw you at the comedy store last night. Uh, I've got five shows next week up the street if you want to do them. It, it, whatever, it can happen. And it's happened for me. 13 and a half years, no agent, no manager but have survived in the business by being constantly in the business, in the machine, being in the hallway of the store, being on the patio of the comedy store, being in front of the comedy store, whatever it's happened, being at a restaurant. Like I said, I've gotten uh, TV roles, movie roles, everything from being in some specific weird place at a time in LA and you cross paths with people. My point is, uh, you never know what the fuck's going to happen in this town. And so there I was getting out of the car. And instead of swiping my card for the uh, parking meter, which takes one second, I had had this army of quarters in my car for a couple of weeks because I was washing Gertie's blankets and towels and stuff. Uh, I had to take them to the laundry because i've got a small laundry machine in my place it just does underwear and socks basically that's all you're washing in my my uh, washing machine so i stop for a minute i go oh wait a minute i got a fucking army of quarters i'm just gonna unload them in this in this uh uh you know parking meter because <clears throat> west hollywood is greedy motherfuckers that charge for parking on a Sunday, just evil. Two hour parking, $2. So I turn around, I go to my car. And the reason I'm setting this up because it's kind of like that movie, uh, was it Crash? I think it might've been with Matt Dillon. Timing is so weird. It's also a, a, a big theme on this TV show, Beef. It's timing. This happened because you were here at this time. But on the way to that, any fucking turn, any change, and your whole day or life or career or anything is totally different. It's so weird how the universe uh, universe works. And it's uh, it's actually fucking pretty spiritual. I believe, I, I believe all in all of this shit, not in a hippie way, but it just happened so many times to me in my life that I'm like, this is what it is, man. And if you back it up, you go, wait, wait a minute. If I just used my credit card and swiped for parking and just walked right into the venue, the next string of events wouldn't happen. And I'm going to tell you what happened. So it's not like it's a big fucking, my career didn't change or anything, but it, 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 it uh, it lines up in such a weird way in my life. So I stop, I get the quarters, I put them in, then we're walking up the street. And as I see the billboard uh, at the, the Troubadour Marquee, I have Greg take a picture of me. I say, hey, take a picture of me real quick with Gertie. And I bring Gertie everywhere. So with Gertie in front of the marquee. So we stop and here's another niche in the timing. Uh, as we stop, the troubadour door opens, the security guy opens and he goes, you guys want to come in now? Cause you know, we're on the guest list. And I go, hold on one second. I just want to get this photo. Now, if that door was open a second sooner, I would have just went in. I wouldn't fucked with the photo. I'd have been like, let's just get inside. It was like 90 degrees out. It got curdy. Whoa, birds. <laughs> so we stopped to take the photo. And as Greg's about to take the photo, there's two girls in line and he goes, hold on, uh, wait for a second. They're, they're moving. They're moving out of the photo. They were polite. And as he's doing that, then a guy comes walking up the street. He goes, wait, I'm going to wait for this guy to go by and then we'll get the photo. As the guy moves, another guy's walking. I go, just take the fucking photo. Let's go in. A guy goes, Dean. And I turn around and it's Mark from death angel. And I'm, I'm like, whoa, what the fuck are you doing here? And he's jogging. And this, about an hour before, 
was I've just read on Instagram that it was the 36th anniversary of Death Angel's ultra violence. And as I was reading that in bed going like, God, 36 years. What a fucking record. Can't believe it's been 36 years. All that's going through my mind this morning, the, that morning. And then I'm like, and now I'm fucking seeing Mark. And the last time I saw him was at the Troubadour when I interviewed him for the podcast. And, and everything was just like, this is fucking insane. And he doesn't live in LA. This guy lives in the Bay Area. And he just happened to be in town for some press for their tour coming up with Creator. So my point is, it's just so fucking weird timing. Timing is so bizarre to me in life. You know, they always say, yeah, you know, bad timing or, you know, too soon or, or you know, they, they were before their time. There's all these things, you know, but it's so weird to think about at what point that wouldn't even have happened. If the security guard opened the door and I just went in, Mark would have just jogged by, looked at the marquee, went, oh, Bill Burke, who kept on his fucking exercising, he was staying in a hotel up the road. All of that is just bizarre to me. So we stop, we hug, we talk. I go, fuck, 36 years, ultra violence. I can't believe it, which is just a goddamn masterpiece. One of the greatest pieces of thrash metal ever recorded. And, you know, the album cover is great. The songs are great. It's so original. They were all like basically in high school. They were friends of mine at the time. And we're still friends and we're still alive. All of that was just blazing through my skull. So I go, Mark, you got to come to this, man. I'll, I'll see if I can get you in. It was sold out. It was it only held 90 because they had it seated. And it was a, a very small event. But we got him in, and for the next two hours, we sat next to each other, and we laughed as Bill Burr just crushed it on his uh, solo Monday morning podcast. Super funny. Unlike this podcast, this one, you're like, well, why don't you try to be funny once in a while? <laughs> so fucking funny, man. Some guy uh, posted on my Instagram, this is the, the world that we live in. And he wrote, I posted up a, uh, a photo of me, right? I was working on some jokes. Liz Vig wrote, um, Liz Vig, the photographer at the store, took a picture while I was writing, working on some jokes on the patio before I was going on. And some guy wrote, look, man, just the reality is you're not funny, dude. Your podcast is great, but you're just not funny. And I just thought, what kind of piece of shit, an actual piece of shit would just sit there for a minute and go, you know what, I'm going to comment on this. And, and instead of just saying, hey, love the podcast, that's all you got to say. Instead of just saying that, he has to throw in, look, man, you're just not funny, which right away, the guy's just a piece of shit. For one thing, I bet he has never seen me. Second of all, if I wasn't funny, I wouldn't be hearing people laugh on a nightly, uh, a nightly, you know, a, a, a nightly, whatever the fuck I'm trying to say, because I'm so mad. And, and I'm not mad, actually, because it didn't affect me at all. I'm just disappointed in how shitty people are. And that's another topic on that beef show shitty people it is wild to watch when you're shitty it's wild to watch how the universe catches you and just starts giving you shit for the rest of your life if you're shitty man the universe is looking man this is uh i'm fucking turning into the new tony Tony Robbins, is that his name? <laughs> I'm, you're here. Dude, you're talking to Dean Del Rey, comedian, podcaster, spiritual guru. <laughs> but, you know, it's true. If you are shitty, it is going to stay with you forever. And you're always going to be angry at other people that are doing what they love to do. 
to sit there and go on and go, dude, it's just a fact. You're not funny. Wait a minute. I was in front of an arena three nights ago, 14,000 people laughing. I guess I'm not funny. You know, nightly people laughing. It's so fucking great to see somebody just play those cards. Cause then it's immediately like, see you later. And I just block them. Blocking is so great. It's just like, see you later, buddy. You know? And, uh, and, and I bet it, it's, he listens to the podcast. That's not good enough for him. You know? And it's definitely, definitely, uh, you know, some angry guy not doing what he loves in life. It's it's hilarious. And that, and that that goes down to, and, you know, it doesn't even phase me. Because it comes down to, I was talking about that new Metallica record come, came out last week, 72 Seasons. And I said, whenever a new Metallica record comes out, you know what's coming next. Tons of negative fucking energy. And I've learned in life how to just keep going with what you love doing and blow, you know, blow that shit off. And I've learned it most of all from Lars and Kirk Hammett. Those are probably the main dudes that get the abuse in Metallica and the band itself actually gets a lot of uh, abuse whenever they put out new music. It is just unreal to me. And you know what? They're like, I don't give a fuck about you guys. It's a small, small percentage, but it looks like it's a lot because the press likes to pick up on the negative shit for the clickbait. So there was first, there was uh, one of the songs, Kirk Hammett solo. Somebody uh, commented, God, this solo is just so basic. A two-year-old could play it or whatever. And then it just snowballed. And people were just like, you know, this solo. And Kirk Emma was great. He's like, yeah, man, whatever, dude. You know, I'm not going to sit there and do arpeggios over a fucking rock metal song. Those are, those are you know, Ingve and, and Steve Vai and, and other guys that do that stuff. It's just amazing that somebody would take the time like that. It's like, how's the fucking song? Doesn't matter. So it sucks, man. He didn't go. He didn't do that. He went. Wow. And I was like, man. You, you need to go jump off a bridge, dude. It's just crazy. And then, of course, you know, this album sucks. Wow. Wow. They're fucking blue up. And like I said, it's a small amount of people. It's very small, but the press loves to pick up on it. But I've learned that when you're in the business, you're putting yourself out there, you're going to have shit people. And most of the time, their opinion does not matter because it, 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 everybody likes different shit. And usually they have bad taste. They're not doing what they want to do in life. They work at some fucking shit job. And I've said it over and over. Then they just get on the keyboard and, you know, fucking fire away. At the same time, they buy tickets to go see the band or they listen to the band still. And I don't understand how you could be a fan of a band and shit on them at the same time. Look, do I love everything on 72 seasons? No. And I'll just be honest. Everybody knows I don't like the load and reload record either. But I love the band. I don't shit on it because half of 72 seasons is fucking incredible. And these guys are 60 years old. They're doing more than 99% of the bands out there. They put out new music. They tour. And they sing for real. They play, you know, they, they play live. They're out doing it for the fans. It's unreal. At 60 years old, I watched him play Master of Puppets on Jimmy Kimmel. And it was 
fucking fierce. They're doing more than all these other bands that are touring with no original members. Not putting any fucking music out, just cashing in and clowning fans. You know, the Skinners, the Foreigners out there, all of them. There's so many bands out there with no original members running tapes and, and just robbing people. And Metallica has kept it real. Same with Death Angel, man. Out there making new records all the time. Death Angel, Testament, all the bands I listen to, they constantly need to make new music. They're not cashing in on their, you know, greatest hits. Metallica's the last four records, and I'm going to say the last four because, yes, I love saying anger. You're going to die on that hill. Yeah, man. St. Anger, uh, the last four records have been fucking great. And this one has some killer songs. Uh, I'll tell you, 72 Seasons, fantastic. Uh, Lux Eterna, fantastic. If Darkness Had a Son, unreal. My favorite of the records so far is Crown of Bob Wire. That is an unusual and great, great tune for Metallica. Chasing Light, really good. Uh, the tune the tune that really kind of bothered me was You Must Burn. It just was, it, it's just too close to Sad But True. I wouldn't have put that on the record because Sad But True is a goddamn masterpiece. And it's funny, I was talking to Dave Elitch yesterday at uh, the Bill Burr taping. And Dave Elitch and I both were like, it all, it all really started after Cliff Burton died. Once Cliff Burton died, they would say, no more Metallica. And I said it before. Then when they put out the Black album, no more Metallica. They suck. Then they cut their hair, fucking no more Metallica. And they just keep going and keep going. 42 years solid and fucking hats off to these guys for putting out a great, great record. Now, that being said, I'm going to listen to it more and more and more. And some of the songs that may not have hit me will probably hit me later in the old fashioned way of uh, how Octung Baby by U2 hit me. So looking forward to diving more into that. Also, it was great to see Mark and uh, congrats on 36 years of the ultra violence record and congrats Metallica on their new record, 72 Seasons, and their fucking massive world tour about to come up, which will be really cool, playing two different, completely different sets each night. A lot of fucking cool shit out there. Great summer. Speaking of great summer, um, well, oh, wait a minute. I wanted to, I wanted to give a shout out right here to some of the new Patreoners. Where's my fucking, here it is. Patreon.com slash Dean Del Rey. Bonus episodes of Let There Be Talk and Zooms, live Zooms. I might do a live Zoom tonight. Uh, God, the riffers are on lunch right now. It's so nice. Let's see. Patreoners, brand new Patreoners. Roger Lewis, thank you. Evan Boyle, killing it. Tracy Shepard, brand new Patreoner. Samuel Shrout and... Rackin, Rackin, brand new Patreon.com slash Dean Del Rey, Patreoners. Thank you so much. I uh, I don't know if you guys saw it, but uh, they, they put together some fans, put together some money and had a Brian Johnson statue made uh, at the very first gig he played with acdc let me look that up real quick i don't know those stuff that things i don't remember his exact uh uh spot he did the first gig because my brain just doesn't work like that anymore you know i need room to remember the bits but um let's see where is it here it is statue is in belgium Statue of ACDC, Brian Johnson has been erected. Erected! Ah, ah, he said erected. Ah. Has been erected in a park in Belgium. So uh, I looked at the statue. June 29th, 1980 was the very first gig Brian Johnson sang 
with ACDC. Really crazy to think about that. And I looked at the statue and I got to say, they fucking nailed it. Because basically, it has him wearing that football jersey, number 22, that he wore in the videos for Back in Black. You know, those four videos they did. Let me put my love into you. Uh, what is it? Rock and Roll Ain't Noise Pollution. Back in Black, Hell's Bells. I think there's five videos. Anyway, it's it's they nailed it. Some of those statues, you know, when you see them. And they're like, they had the unveiling and they pull the curtain down and it comes down and you're like, uh, yeah, I, I, I guess so. And when the people are making the statue, are you stopping by going like, uh, I don't think that really looks like him. I mean, that's almost embarrassing. The greatest statue I've ever seen is the Lemmy one at the Rainbow Bar and Grill. And it's outside. You can take pictures of it. Full size. Lemmy, and I'm telling you, it is the perfect, perfect statue. It looks just like Lemmy. But there's been statues over uh, the years and those figurine toys that these companies put out. You know, they're like, now you can get the the authentic such and such. And you look at it and you go, yeah, that's that's not him at all. So this Brian Johnson statue is fantastic. And uh, they nailed it. He's got the hat. He's got the 22 jersey. He's just up there going for it. And I, I just thought it was really cool. I still think that Brian Johnson is one of the greatest singers ever. And that's another band that gets the old, no Bond, no ACDC for me, fuck you. Which is just crazy. Because that means you're denying some of the greatest rock records of all time. Back in Black, Those About to Rock and Flick of the Switch, which by the way, lately I've been noticing Flick of the Switch getting some love around, around the world. People are starting to discover Flick of the Switch, a record that came out in 1983. They're like, hey, you know, this record's pretty fucking good. It's like, yeah, you think so? I mean, listen to that thing. It's so fucking raw, no mutt lang, just raw fucking rock. So, yeah, Brian Johnson gets a statue and well-deserved. Also, thank you, everybody, for the kind words of the on the video footage of me singing with Primus and members of Tool and Queens of the Stone Age. That happened last Monday night. I was asked to host the Jimmy Hayward benefit, which, by the way, the link to donate to his GoFundMe is on my YouTube channel on the video. You can see the full video of me singing with Primus and Tool and Queens of the Stone Age guys. It's all a Primus. And then it's uh, Danny and Justin from Tool and it's Troy Van Leeuwen from Queens of the Stone Age and Jimmy Hayward on guitar and then me singing Whole lot of Rosie and I've had a, about a week to think about it and take it in now. And I would say that that was probably the top five things I've ever done in my life to sing with Primus and Tool. First of all, two of the greatest bands ever and Queens of the Stone Age, of course. But to sing with Primus and knowing these guys since I was a kid and no way did I think Ever, I would see Les play ACDC's Whole Lot of Rosie and play it fucking perfect, of course. These guys are so good at their instruments that it must be so hard to play ACDC because they're just like fighting, not going like... <laughs> oh man it's it's it was an epic night i got to host the show and the crowd was electric the merch was incredible and jimmy will be on the show i think next week and we'll talk about exactly what's going on with him he's done uh, animation killer videos for tool over the years and mastodon and 
other great bands. He has worked on incredible movies. He is a uh, a rock and roller, has a band with Brent Hines, the Siegelman, and a, a fantastic human. So any donation you could do would be greatly appreciated. And uh, I want to make sure that we hit that mark on the GoFundMe. But once again, I, it was mind boggling to do that. It was really insane. And I'll, I'll never forget it. Um, so yeah, congrats to Brian Johnson on the statue and uh, all of that good stuff. I've been uh, doing a little work around the apartment <clears throat> and I needed some wood. And I went down to the lumber yard and, you know, I think I know about three types of wood. You got the, the high school kid wood being boner. Dude, I got full wood. Then you got redwood. You got pine. You got walnut. What else you got? That's probably it. Cedar. Now you got cedar. There's just these woods you, you know about, these trees. And uh, so I was down there and I was looking at some walnut and it's a fucking fortune. I was like, God damn. Oh, you know, I mean, after COVID, everything's just triple. I mean, that's just how it is. It's supply issues, you know, it's going it's, it's to, yeah, it's triple. The, the price of the wood is triple. Uh, it's just, it's just what it is. I'm sorry, man. It's just, uh, you know, uh, we're just going to charge triple for life on everything now. Gas, wood. Uh, coffee, uh, you know, anything, concerts, movies, popcorn. So I go down there and I'm looking at the different woods and the guy's like, uh, yeah, so this is the walnut. I go, yeah, God damn, that's way too much. And then he's like, uh, and then we got some, uh, we got pine over here. We got cedar, redwood, redwood. And, uh, and then he says, we got this, let me get this wood out. Cause I'm like, <laughs> you know, we got this over here. What was it called? Hemlock. Uh, hemlock. The fuck tree is hemlock? He's like, yeah, yeah. I got what? I'm 57. I've been all over, you know, the forest and stuff. They never like uh, the beautiful hemlock trees here. I'm like, what is a hemlock? And I will tell you this, it's the most generic looking grain wood ever. It almost looks fake. It looks like uh, when people paint uh, onto, you know, they can make shit look like wood or leather. You ever seen these guys? They come into your house, they can paint your fucking walls to look leather. It's insane, actually, how good these guys are. You go in, your house looks like leather or wood or, you know, I forget what those guys are called. But they do a lot of set work. They'll you know, go into a place. They can make your house, your sheetrock, look like metal, like a warehouse. They can paint your sheetrock to look like, you know, just old, rusted warehouse. So the guy's like, yeah, hemlock, man. Uh, and so I, I hit him. I go, well, where's the fucking hemlock trees from? Where? What is hemlock? And he just looked at me like, doesn't matter. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm just asking, dude. I've never heard of hemlock. I know redwood, cedar, walnut. You know what? What is hemlock? And he just walked away because he didn't know either. I, I, I think I was the first person that asked him, what the fuck is a hemlock tree? I've never seen it. Where does it grow? You know? I should have looked it up. Let's look it up, actually. <laughs> Is this exciting content or what, people? You follow me. We figure out. Fuck it. Here it is. Hemlock. Hemlock. A highly poisonous European plant. The fuck? Uh, number two is hemlock fir or hemlock spruce. A North American tree with dark green foliage that is said to smell like hemlock when crushed. Grown... Uh, for timber and pulp production, also grown in Europe uh, as ornamental. Yeah, look at that first one. Hemlock, a highly poisonous European plant. 
of the parsley family. Is that like that shit? What was that shit that they used uh, on Breaking Bad? Remember, it's just like one fucking small grain. It's like basically like fentanyl of plants. You just touch it and you're fucking dead. I can't even remember what it was called. And I knew it. Ricin. Boom. Brain's working. Ricin. Old fucking. Old breaking bad knowledge. It's funny, like you learn about ricin and then people are talking about it for a couple of years. Yeah, I think he slipped him some ricin. <laughs> anyway, hemlock tree. I'm in there and I, I had to go with it. It was the cheapest. I go, I guess I'll get it. And then a guy stained it up for me to look like walnut. So I've got like fake walnut, but it's real wood. It's hemlock to look like wal <laughs> walnut. So I'm killing it out here with the fucking simulated walnut wood. Oh man, I don't know. I'm just happy they're fucking not hammering right now. All right, I'm going through my notes here because uh, I don't want to miss anything this week. Last week, I wanted to talk about some stuff and I missed it and then it's really kind of uh, done, you know? Uh, podcast is brought to you by Banker Guitar. Speaking of wood, Banker, king of the Karina. You know, Matt, Mr. Banker himself has more Karina wood than I've ever fucking seen. And he's spitting out some of the greatest handmade V's and Explorers on the planet. Basically crushing everyone on the handmade Karina V's and Explorers. It's just unreal. He also is doing some amazing SG arch tops that look insane and played by all your favorites, Marcus King, Mastodon, uh, who else? Uh, uh, a lot of people play him, man. Fuck it. All kinds of people are playing Banker now. And uh, you can get yourself a handmade guitar. Hit up bankerguitars.com and tell them I sent you. Ask for Matt. Him and his wife just killing it over there. Follow him on Instagram, Banker Guitars. And look at this guy's incredible stuff. Banker Guitars, handmade custom guitars. Also, Migos Dog. You got to get your dog some incredible clean food. If you live in the LA area, they are delivering to houses now. MigosDog.com. Human grade food, unbelievable. They got salmon, beef, chicken, and they've got a puppy mix. You can get it also at Erwan and Healthy Spot. MigosDog.com, made right in Malibu with human grade food. No bullshit in there. No sawdust. No fucking ground up bones and shit. It's just human grade, perfect dog food. Migos Dog. Dot com and for your denim needs standard and strange.com you need some boots you need some japanese denim you need some real mccoy's buko leathers all of my clothing comes from standard and strange.com two of the greatest humans in the business jeremy and neil tell them i sent you call them up follow them on instagram or go to the store in berkeley new york or new mexico I'll be stopping in there uh, next month when I'm doing Alameda. I'm returning to Alameda to do shows. I got that right here. Let me get that for you. And I'm doing Santa Rosa, which I have not done ever, Santa Rosa, uh, comedy-wise. So get your tickets, deandelray.com, my friends. Look here, my friends. <clears throat> Man. I'm getting tore up here by some allergies or something. I don't know what it is, but my ears are all fucked up. Faction Brewing. And that is going to be Friday, June 9th and Saturday, June 10th. You can catch me in Alameda at Bay Area's hottest comedy show featuring the funniest comics from North Carolina. Or not, not North Carolina, from Northern California. <laughs> Grab a pint and get some laughs. Uh, Faction 
brewing. So that's going to be in Alameda. And then I'm up there in Santa Rosa and Lincoln, California. I'll be doing two nights with Bill Burr, Lincoln, California. Those are all on the website. Also my merch, you can get the tree hat by DM and me. I have the new tree hat. Here it is. Hold on, let me get it. Hold on here. Tree hat. Oh yeah. Yeah. Look at the tree hat. There it is right there. Tree hat. My collab with the great Aaron Draplin. If you have not heard the episode with Aaron Draplin, check it out. Speaking of Draplin, I'm trying to uh, get the Grail podcast back up and running. I have just, uh, I'm going to be honest with you. I've just been out of my mind the last six months or so. My mom passed. I've said it a million times. But even before that, man, it just seems like so much is just coming in and also i just i just didn't understand how much work it was going to be to do a podcast network two three different shows write comedy travel do comedy and and the honest truth is i'm trying to run like i'm in my early 40s and i'm 57 years old man and i'm fucking tired and in reality, all I'd really love to do is just the podcast once a week, let there be talk, and then do comedy. And But I love the grail, and I feel that these people deserve their own show. But man, until I can get some help, I'm just a one-man show, and it's really fucking gnarly, man. It really is. It's uh, I just want to have a little bit of time to rest and just dick off. I don't have much dicking off time. I've got to constantly work. I've got to constantly work on these jokes and 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 do comedy and then podcast. And in between all of that, it's like fuck. I gotta I gotta do the grail. But it's a uh, I, I, it's a passion of mine, and I really do want to get it back up and running. And I don't know if I should just keep it all on, let there be talk again, or keep with the original vision. I don't like to quit anything. Uh, so I'm, I'm just trying to figure it out. But I do believe that the grail, just for the artwork alone, the grail needs to survive and live. The artwork is so fucking good. And I love the idea of having these people have their own show. I'm just... Uh, I just fucking, I just try to do so much stuff to keep myself out there. And uh, so, yeah, that's what I'm trying to figure out. So I, I want to get the grail going again. I want to thank all of you guys for tuning in and uh, hope to see you at some of the live shows and hope to see you on the Patreon, on the Zooms and the bonus episodes. I dropped a bonus episode a few days ago. I really liked it. It's a good episode. I hope you like this solo episode. Please subscribe to the YouTube channel and subscribe on iTunes and everywhere else that you get your podcast, cactusradionetwork.com. I keep it going, man. I keep it going for mostly, I keep it going for you guys. Without you guys, there's just no need to do this. That's just the bottom line. If there was no listeners, I wouldn't be doing this. <laughs> After 11 years, I'd be like, yeah, yeah, I did it. So it's great to uh, see your emails and your DMs. And like I said, share all my content on all of your platforms, your Facebooks, your Instagrams, your TikToks, your Twitters. Uh oh, phone's ringing. And that is Andrew Themelis, the guy that produced the uh, live podcast yesterday. Candles lit, my friends. See ya.